मिस्टर वरुण a very good afternoon and greetings for the day i varun paul science policy officer welcomes you all on behalf of directorate of innovation projects and consultancy and jacob institute of biotechnology and bioengineering to present webinar on the topic covid-19 detection and entrepreneurial opportunities for patients and non patients to begin with i would like to request university chaplain reverend dr Samuel Richmond to lead us into the word of prayer. Before we pray, I would like to read from the Bible, Psalm chapter hundred. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us. and we are his we are his people and the sheep of his pasture enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise give thanks to him bless his name for the lord is good his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations as we begin this international webinar let us look a lord in prayer our gracious heavenly father we come into thy presence we are thankful and grateful to you for this wonderful day that you have given to us and by organizing this international webinar we are being reminded about the purpose and the responsibility that we have for our institute for our society and for the whole mankind we are thankful lord master that even in this crisis of covid-19 we are able to give hope to the people by organizing this important webinar covid-19 detection and entrepreneurial opportunities for patients and non patients what a privilege lord that we have received we are thankful lord for this great institution which has been started by your servant dr sam higginbottom more than 100 years back and we are thankful for the present leadership of our honorable vice chancellor sir that you continue to bless him that this institute this university may continue to grow we are thankful for our pro vice chancellors respected registrars and joint registrar deans directors and everyone who has been contributing to this great institution we ask your blessing upon our students especially lord we are thankful for the directorate of innovative projects and consultancy and jacob institute of biotechnology and bioengineering that they are able to organize this webinar we seek your special blessing upon this webinar especially we pray for the director and the dean uh, professor jonathan lal under whose leadership this uh, uh, program is been organized we pray for the speakers eminent speakers who will be coming and sharing uh, from this platform to many that you bless them also we pray for our joint registrar engineer westley that he is helping and coordinating this whole uh, webinar uh, through this technology we pray for that you bless him and also use him in this area we also pray for all the participants that they may not find any difficulty in connecting with this uh, webinar without any hassle they may participate they may learn and they may be a blessing for others as whatever is being shared through this platform we pray that your name be praised and glorified and we may continue to be the hope for the whole world thank you lord for everything you are a lord our creator and we glorify and magnify your holy name in jesus christ name we pray amen
thank you sir on behalf of the directorate of ipc and gibv i would like to welcome honorable vice chancellor sir all the pro vice for the all the pro, pro vice chancellors registrar distinguished speaker directors deans head of the departments faculty members my dear colleagues students and all the participants to the to this webinar on the topic covid-19 detection and entrepreneurial opportunities for patients and non patients now i would like to request joint registrar shuvas engineer c john wesley sir to provide our participants and listeners a brief glimpse about shuvas thank you varun a respected keynote speaker professor dr sarvas mor dean jagavin stop biotechnology and bioengineering professor dr jonathan a lol my dear participants sami ke bottom university of agriculture technology and sciences shuarts earlier known as alabad agriculture institute was established in the year 1910 under the leadership of dr sam higginbottom an american scientist the institution has completed more than 110 years of dedicated and relentless service to the nation with its vision gospel and flow and mission feed the hungry serve the land under the dynamic leadership of a honorable vice chancellor most of them professor rajendra bilal alabad agriculture institute was conferred the deemed to be university by ministry of human resource development government of india in the year 2000 later during the centenary year of the institute in the year 2010 mhrd renamed our institution as sam migimbodum institute of agriculture technology and sciences deemed to be university Uh, in the year 2016 after considering the adequate availability of teaching and non teaching staff and other essential infrastructure facilities the uttar pradesh legislature decided to upgrade reconstitute and establish shiarts deemed university as a full fledged university under state act hence now we are a state university sami ke bottom university of agriculture technology and science shiarts is a united endeavor of Christian community in India for promoting rural life and development in conformity with the Christian vision of human kind and the creation. The university is held in trust as a common ecumenical heritage by the Christian churches and Christian organizations of this country. It seeks to be a national center for professional excellence in education and service to the people with participation of students and faculty members from all over India and abroad. University operates with faculty of agriculture engineering and technology sciences business studies animal husbandry theology humanities education film and mass communication and health sciences faculties shuarts is an iso 9001 2015 certified institution and a recognized member of different associations including association of indian universities international association of universities indian agriculture universities association Association of Commonwealth Universities, Asia Pacific Association of Agriculture Research, and many more. The university has signed many international and national MOUs and academics and research collaborations with institutions of national and international repute. National Assessment of Accreditation Council (NAC), an autonomous institution of UGC, accredited our university with A grade in the year 2013. In the year 2014, MHRD Government of India placed our institution when we were a deemed university that time and amongst A grade institutions in the in the in the country. Many of our colleges are accredited by various accrediting agencies. Currently, we have more than 13,000 students pursuing their higher studies on campus. We have more than 2,000 teaching and non-teaching faculty members from across the country and from abroad. With these words, I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the university and wish you all a wonderful experience through the course of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the brief introduction. Now I would like to hand over the mic to my colleague, Mrs. Juhi Shrivastav. the ip development officer of shua of uh, shuwas ipc provide a glimpse about directorate of ipc a very good afternoon to all of you 
directorate of innovation projects and consultancy that is ipc caters to the services for staff students as well as the external parties for the protection of intellectual property generated from the useful research provides consultancy services to other organizations using the know how of the talented minds of the university facilitates technology transfer to the industries promotes the development and enrichment of entrepreneurship culture within the university through entrepreneurship development cell a part of ipc contract research etc and other like activities ipc has developed a comprehensive policy for ip protection and incubation ips of the university including patents from the department of industrial microbiology mechanical engineering department of food process engineering has been protected with indian patent office various trademarks like agis uh, schwartz uh, plant variety, variety of uh, varieties of plant variety and copyrights have been protected schwartz has also entered into many consultancy assignments with national and international organizations like taco bell noshbo isro up jal nigam etc collaboration with various universities and other organizations both in india and abroad with mous has enabled schwartz to spread its wings globally to enable a smooth transaction of work staff ipc coordinators across all the departments colleges schools institutes plays an instrumental role entrepreneurship and innovators club which is epic a cell for students is actively involved with ipc to promote entrepreneurship with a view to promote the motto of atmanirbhar bharat given by the honorable prime minister of india schwartz aims to create a sangam of socialism and capitalism to serve the nation by training our students to sail on the boat of entrepreneurship this will also enable them to be job providers rather than job seekers for the gen next in order to strengthen this ipc is actively involved for setting up of incubation center within the campus of schwartz for startup companies to be formed with or without using ips of the university in ipc we regularly carry out screening of the business plan for of students measures to build business out of the protected ip please note that this service is open to other to external organizations independent startups who are willing to incubate at schwartz time to time various seminars and workshops are being organized for uh, spreading awareness and at times jointly with organizations such as msme nsic etc along with the directorate of research which is currently headed by professor dr salesh marker uh, this directorate plays a pivotal role for strengthening the research in the university ipc seeks to nurture the research outputs into intellectual property for potential business development thereby boosting the economic development of the region through self employability taking our motto forward we have organized the present seminar in the difficult times of pandemic the present seminar with a distinguished speaker will help us to consider the entrepreneurship opportunities for all of us including patients thank you very much over to you varun thank you dr now with the growing importance of of the field of biotechnology i would like to request professor dr veeru prakash sir the associate dean jacob institute of biotechnology and bioengineering and nodal officer entrepreneurship development cell to throw light on jibb the, the institute of biotechnology in schwartz over to you sir thank you varun good afternoon dear speaker and participants it is indeed a great pleasure to introduce the jacob institute of biotechnology and bioengineering even though the college of biotechnology was embodied as a separate functional unit in the year 2005 we were the first in india to initiate a big tech biotechnology program along with iit kharpu in the year 2001 The college then transferred into the present Jacob Institute of Biotechnology and Bioengineering through the years by casting and recasting its curriculum. Presently, JIBB is constituted of four departments: the departments, uh, Department of Molecular and Cellular Engineering, Department of uh, Industrial Microbiology, the Department of Biochemistry and Biochemical Engineering, and Department of Computational Biology and Bioinformatics. these are catering to all the fields of biotechnology the institute offers 
five undergraduate, nine postgraduate, two PG diploma course, and four doctor programs. Presently, the student strength of JIBB is approximately 700, and the teaching faculty strength is 45, including visiting faculty from abroad. JIBB is privileged to have a group of eminent teachers who have acquired their professional degrees from prestigious institutions from India and abroad, including triple IITs, NITs, AIMS, Massachusetts University, Delft University of Technology, Cornell University, University of Haifa, University of Michigan, University of Berlin, and University of Birmingham, to name a few. Now, the departments are well facilitated with the state of the art equipment and catering to, all, to the demands and the challenges of the time. The curriculum is framed in such a way that the students are abreast with the latest development by revamping the syllabi time to time. Other than academics, the institute nurture the core curricular and extracurricular capabilities of the students to develop them as a socially responsible and dynamic personalities. The institute is recognized by its august alumni who are well placed in India and abroad and making their imprint in whichever field they are. Our students are placed in national organizations such as DRDO, ICR, ICMR, CSIR institutes, and reputed companies including Bicon, Cipla, Dr. Reddy's, etc., and various multinational companies globally. Our students are pursuing their degrees from the various IITs, prestigious universities like Oxford, Michigan, Cornell, Stanford, etc with full scholarship. And some are working as a faculty in research labs and institutes abroad. The institute has to its credit two granted patents out of seven patents filed. The institute is currently running various research projects funded by various national and international organizations. We are proud to state that many of our alumni are working in the forefront of the fight against COVID-19 Pandemic as scientific research associates, scientists, research associates, and the technical experts. Now, I take the opportunity to announce that the SWARS has already put its admission process. For the next academic session, interested candidates can visit our website, that is www.swarts.edu.in, for further details. As academic fraternity, we are ever ready to take up the responsibilities and challenges of the time. And personally, I feel proud to be the part of this prestigious institute and the legacy of Swartz. Thank you. Arun, Varun, please. Thank you, Viruso. With this, uh, I would like to request our director IPC Professor Dr. Engineer Jonathan A. Lalsa to introduce our distinguished speaker for the day. Over to you, sir. Over to you, Jonathan, sir. Jonathan, sir, over to you. Unmute, unmute, please. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Good afternoon, all. It is my privilege to welcome uh, Professor Sarvasi More. That is my job as the uh, Dean of Biotechnology and Director of IPC. It is an uh, honor and a privilege. Um, Professor Sarvas More is the Director of the Institute of Public Health Genomics at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. He's also the head of um, infectious disease. Uh, an infection control uh, at the Free University Medical Center, Amsterdam. He is also heading the referral lab for chlamydia trachomatis uh, in Amsterdam. Furthermore, it is a privilege to also say that he's also a visiting professor at Schwartz as well. More importantly uh, for me, um, he has been my former boss uh, when I was in Maastricht and he's a mentor and he's a good colleague and a dear friend. And his background has been in molecular biology and biochemistry, and his PhD has been in the Department of Pathology. 
He furthermore has a master's in bio business and entrepreneurship. So he is the uh, perfect blend um, between a distinguished honorable scientist and a serial entrepreneur because he has several companies spin-offs coming out. So that's why this particular webinar was a combination between the directorate of IPC, which is focused on entrepreneurship, startup companies, intellectual property, and the Jacob Institute of Biotechnology and Bioengineering because it is also a hardcore research. And Sarvas is the best blend between the two. And without much further ado, I will in a, in a second hand over the mic to Sarvas. But um, dear uh, participants, if you have any questions at the lower part of your screen, there is a Q&A section. So during the lecture of uh, Professor Sarvas More, if you have questions, please put your questions down there. Our colleagues will collect those questions and based on the amount of time remaining, we may ask those questions. With, uh, without much further delay, uh, Professor Sarvas More, welcome. And now I hand over the mic to you for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, for the very kind words. Um, you're also indeed a long-standing uh, colleague to me and a dear friend for many years. And it's really an honor that your university and your setting uh, offers the opportunity to give me the chance to give a lecture here. Professor More, yes, that seems. Yeah, find the okay. screen option in the lower footer. I try to. More. Yeah. To share the screen, but. Do you find that screen share option? I sincerely apologize. No problem, sir. Take your time. I did try the screen option, but... Yeah, there is a share screen option, a green icon in the center, lower center. No, I already had it, but I'm, I'm able to to go back. This is so weird. Share screen. Oh my God. Easy, Professor. Please let me know, I can guide, guide you through. Is it shared currently? Not yet. Why doesn't it share? I just don't understand. Share my screen. If it's if it, maybe you can send the presentation by email to us and we can share it from here. We can also do that if you're having a problem there. Oh my God, it's a bit of Professor, uh, when you hit the share screen uh, window, what, what, what you're seeing? Everything worked fine yesterday, but...
professor yes yeah when you when you click share screen a window is opening right do you see a window under basic screen whiteboard iphone ipad talk to me professor i will guide you through is it currently shared or not not yet sir not yet i, I just don't understand where sir i let me guide you through is your presentation open currently open your presentation is it, sir if i do share screen so if your presentation is open yeah we have it now good to go sir it is open now yes perfect i i sincerely apologize uh, for the delay uh, causing here um I'm very glad that uh, Jonathan uh, already uh, explained most of the things. I have different positions in different universities, both in Amsterdam and uh, since two years uh, visiting professorship at Schuarts, which is really to make our collaboration uh, as good as possible, both for research and for entrepreneurial opportunities. I will tell you something about mainly the detection of COVID-19. What I will not do is explain all type of tests which are available. I will really focus on interpreting test characteristics because I feel there is a lot to do about this and how you should deal with essays and implementing new essays in your setting. Secondly, uh, we have recently made a coronalab.eu, which is a, a small to medium enterprise setting where we test patients for serology and PCR and also non-patients in a direct-to-consumer testing, and that will be the second half of my presentation. So when you look at serology essays, there are different tests. The one which are offered in many countries are so-called home tests, where you collect blood at home by a finger prick and directly apply the blood on an essay. These essays are forbidden in my country and many European countries because they are really unreliable and there's no clinician to really make a good attempt in interpreting the results. The second type of test are the point of care tests, which are used on location, like on a parking lot or inside laboratories. And the blood is also here directly applied to a point of care cassette or blood is collected at home in a micro container. Some of these essays have been recently accorded inside the Netherlands and, Euro and uh, Europe and give a reliable test result, but they have usually a lower sensitivity and specificity. And the specificity which is low means that the positive test results need to be confirmed. What we are using and also many other companies is a cassette which is sent to your home. The blood is collected at home and sent back to the laboratory and inside the laboratory, either a point of care or an ELISA test or a combination is used. From all serology essays, the ELISA is the most reliable essay. And as the word point of care means that which is done in 10 to 15 minutes and ELISA takes many hours. There are currently over hundred types of point of care and ELISA. Many of those are not well validated. To give you an example inside the UK and Spain, over 30 million of those point of care tests have been bought by governments. And after using, they have been sent back because they were highly unreliable in their test results. For the PCR systems, there are more or less two systems which are used in the Netherlands. That is an in-house system, which is validated by our National Institute for Public Health and the Environment which is an essay based on two targets for uh, COVID-19 and a human gene to have a control if samples are taken properly. If you do this essay well and show to the government you have good sensitivity in serial dilutions, 
have a good setting and show that also in blinded panels, you can pick out the weak and strong positives, you will get a certificate. Besides this in-house essay, which is certificate inside the Netherlands for over 45 laboratories, there are of course also many commercial essays. There are also a lot of new companies which have essays which have not been properly validated yet and not been published yet, but this is currently improving. So this is our certificate we got from our government. We are currently using our self-rose PCR systems. You can use that in 96 and 384 wells, format meaning a lot of samples per day can be processed. We used a an, an nucleate acid isolation system called the Chemagic Magnetic Separation Module. And currently we have uh, worked on a new implementation of a Perkin Elmer system, both the PCR system, but also new equipment, which is quicker in the results. So that we have two independent streets for COVID testing. If you look to the test characteristics, the most important one, I think, are the sensitivity and the specificity. The sensitivity is the probability of a positive test given that a patient has the disease. The specificity is the probability of a negative test given that a patient is well. And I would like to talk about a few items which really influence your test characteristics. The first is the population. Many of the essays uh, for serology, but also for PCR, if you look to the instructions for use, there are information on the test characteristics. Many of these claims are made in small groups of extremely symptomatic patients uh, linked to a group of completely asymptomatic patients or serology from a few years back to make sure that your specificity is correct. Often the details of the groups are missing. If you look to serology versus PCR, many of these comparisons made are complex to interpret it correctly since there is no well-defined golden standard. I will explain a little bit on this more later. Finally, the size of your study group. The smaller the group is, the less reliable your test characteristics will be. And many comparisons are just too small currently both on a country level and on the instructions for use to give a really good sense and spec in your groups. First of all, the size of the study group. To give you an example, some of the instructions for use have only evaluated like 50 persons, 10 positives and 40 negatives. You can imagine that if you have 10 positives and you're missing one, your sensitivity is directly 90%. Do you miss two? It's already 80%. If you have a population, not of 50, but 10 times as large, and it is 500 patients, and you test 100 positives and 400 negatives, if you miss one case, your sensitivity will only be 1% less. And in this way, using large groups in determining the sensitivity and the specificity in a specific population, they give way more reliable results. So be very carefully if you define a mandatory sensitivity and specificity for your essay as a government, let's say it should be 98% sensitivity of higher, that you really use the correct groups and the sizes which belong to that. The population. The essay can be used in asymptomatic patients, but also in symptomatic infected patients, or even at patients who have been admitted to the intensive care or who have actually died. If you look to a lot of the instructions for use, they only have one of those groups and sometimes two, which means that if you look at the test characteristics and you implement such an essay inside your setting, you have to be very carefully if it fulfills the requirement inside the IFU for the application field, and if it is not completely clear, you have to make your own evaluation inside your setting. One of the things in the beginning specifically, it was not clear inside these instructions for use, 
how long does a patient actually have symptoms when you obtain the sense and spec, which is very relevant for both PCR and serology. Most reliable for serology only after 20 days of onset of the symptoms. For PCR, one might not be too early since the virus may still be in the lungs, but not yet present in the throat swab or nasopharyngeal swab. These type of details are often forgotten inside the claims on sense and specificity. And if a test is evaluated in symptomatic persons only, can you use it in an asymptomatic population group? You have to take care of these type of questions before you implement your essays. If you look to serology via Virtus PCR, to give you a few examples, if you have 100 PCR positive symptomatic patients who attended the hospital and you use an IgG assay and only 80% is positive, can you then say that serology is only 80% sensitive? Personally, I don't think so, but many publications saw these type of comparisons. You're comparing an active infection to a serology assay, which is more on past and partially current infections. And these are two things which are not always easy to compare. The same is if you use 100 PCR negative symptomatic patients who attended the hospital, and we have done that recently, over 20% was actually IgG positive. Can you then say that PCR missed 20% of the cases? Again, I do not think so. So be very careful how you compare essays and how you define your sense and spec. Looking at the more entrepreneurial work, which is done in our setting, we have two companies, Microbe and Lab and Inbion. I myself, I'm a finder and advisor. I'm not a manager in the setting. That is Dries Bunning, who is CEO of both companies. And I would like you to tell a little bit of what we do in those companies. So what we normally do is direct to consumer testing where we offer boxes, which are sent by post so that you can collect at home your samples sent them back by a post or a courier system. And in the laboratory, we provide results which are available in an online portal using a unique code. We also make our own diagnostic assays to actually determine these type of diseases. So this brought for us the idea, can we also not do that for Corona? So we have two types of assays. We have an assay for serology where we provide you materials which you can order online take your blood at home, send it to our laboratory, and we can determine if you had corona in the past so that you know if you had system symptoms that it is actually caused by corona or not. It also provides you a partial insight if your immune system has a, a partial um, protection against current infections for corona how long that takes and how well the protection is, that is not yet clear. And long-standing studies in follow-up are currently being done on many places in the world to actually assess. It is, however, already clear that just having an IgG response, it does not directly mean you are protected. And if you do not have an IgG response, it also does not mean there is protection. We also have made a PCR test for current infections, which is a PCR availability where also material can be collected in companies. We do not provide this to individual persons in a direct to consumer setting since that is not allowed inside my country. Specifically because you cannot assess how individual takes their own throat swap and it might result in unreliable swaps. Finally, what we have done recently, since many countries re recently request that people who want to fly to their holidays, they need a PCR before boarding. And in different countries, you need a PCR test, which has been taken three, four, or seven days before you leave. Very recently, three days ago, there's even one of the countries who wants both a PCR essay and a serology essay. And especially the serology essay is a complex one because what is the validity of being negative or positive for current infections? And I think 
it brings travelers for a lot of additional cost while it is potentially not that informative. So inside our website, we have made small movies on how companies should take their PCRs and how individuals should take uh, their serum by making a finger prick. Again, everything is anonymous uh, because that is mandatory for all the privacy rules. It also means actually that the company who is sending the test to the individuals is not linked to the coding inside boxes and the codes are only available to the person itself. So if he loses their codes, we can actually not find back their test result anymore, making it completely anonymous. For the test traveler, since there is so little time, sometimes only 48 hours before the results have to be available, there is a technique how to quicker handle large amount of specimens. And that is called pooling of clinical samples. What you could do is take from 10 individual samples, which you see on the left, take a small portion of each, pull that in one tube, do only one nucleic acid isolation, do only one PCR result. And if the result is negative, you say that all the results are negative and you can give 10 certificates for entering and boarding your airplane. If the result is positive, you have to go back to all your 10 individual results and do them all 10 individually again and find out which of the 10 was actually positive. The nine which are negative, of course, can board. The one who is positive is not allowed to enter the plane currently. And as a company, we are required to inform our CDC in the Netherlands called the GGD and we have to, the REVM, and we have to inform our municipal health service to be able to do contact tracing around a positive person. And they can, of course, not board. Now, this sounds very nice because it adds speed to the whole process. And it also saves a lot of money because instead of 10 for almost all, you only have to do one PCR. But is this a wise approach? Although the advantages are clear, there are also disadvantages. Everyone will understand that it will reduce the sensitivity of the PCR assay, and it will result in missing weak positive persons. We also use an internal control to see if samples are taken properly, a so-called human HLA gene. If you pull 10 samples and one is negative for HLA, meaning it is not being correctly taken by the physician, Using the pool result, you will give that person a positive HLA and thus a correct sample. In real life, if you would have test individually, the sample was not reliable to give any result and you should obtain a new sample. You cannot do that while pooling. So the consequences. Technically, it's easy to pool. It's used for many infectious diseases and epidemiological research. Clinically, a weak positive sample can mean two things. First of all, someone is clearing the infection and will go from weak positive to negative very soon. And it is even questionable if all the viral particles are still viable and that it can result in infection of other people. It can, however, also mean that someone with a low titer, let's say a CP value of 37, above 40 is negative, that he just or she got infected and then in a week the CP value will be 29 and in two weeks even before 20. Since you do not do any follow-up sample, it is highly unlogical and difficult to say if such a result is from a positive or negative patient. The yes advocate of this will say well, there's a very low chance of finding a positive sample. Look at the number of positive that we still find in the Netherlands or other countries. Some people say that the weak positives are not relevant because it's not living virus and only dead material. But like I just explained, that is only one of the two options. 
They also say in the airplane are good measures. There are mass, there are good filters, there's cleaning, there's laminar flows, there's little movements. So the chance of infecting an entire airplane is almost zero. And the chance on HV negative samples is small. So their argument is small chance times small chance times small chance is almost no chance, so pooling is acceptable. The ones who say, yes, be careful, are the ones who say that we currently do not test symptomatic patients. It are travelers without symptoms because otherwise they may not be tested. People who have no complaints. So you will only find very low PCR values. So pooling in this population is a very risky thing. The different airlines seats have been sold to different providers. It actually results that people who use a a PCR certificate, which is based on a pooling strategy, will sit besides patients or travelers who have a negative test result by individual testing. And this is a rather undesirable situation. To give you an example, that it is not a problem that an entire airplane becomes infected, but the issue is how many get infected. In 2003, a 72-year-old man with SARS-1 flew from Hong Kong to Beijing, two hours, 45 minutes, 120 people aboard, 22 got infected and five died. Of course, in the current setting, there is way more cleaning, people drive masks. But if someone is positive in a plane and you fly from Amsterdam to Curaçao, it's not two hours, 45 minutes, it's 10 hours, increasing the chance. So the conclusion. First of all, I think that the pooling of samples for epidemiological and research studies, I think that's quite acceptable because it's not diagnostics. The pooling for samples for passengers in an airplane, I think it's highly undesirable because you will generate chances that you act such that you give negative test results due to the pooling and positive people will enter your plane. To give you a summary of the webinar, first of all, I would advise you to be very critical of test characteristics you read in publication, especially in instructions for you. Think very well on your study design. If you evaluate a new essay you want to implement in your lab setting. The commercial opportunities for COVID-19 testing are possible both in a direct-to-consumer and in a business-to-business -business approach. And many companies dive into this. However, be very critical on the approach you use, the essays you offer to your clients, and realize you should offer people a good and reliable test result. Quality above speed and profit. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um... Professor Sarvas More for this excellent presentation. Do you have uh, a minute or two for a few questions from the audience? Can I ask? Yes. Uh, because the audience is coming from all different uh, views of life. One audience is asking, what is better, serology-based testing or PCR-based testing? He, he wants to see your personal view on that, which is more better for COVID-19 testing. It depends highly on the reason why you use it. If you want to identify active infections, you should only use PCR. If you want to show to people that they have had the infection in the past, you can only offer serology. So it's not one is better than the other. It depends on the application. What is currently done is investigating for patients who are attended to a hospital, if you can take a combination of both, because like I said, a lot of the PCR negative patients up to 20% are actually serology positive because the virus is still deep in the lung and taking a nasopharyngeal and throat swab will just result in a negative PCR, meaning the theoretical conclusion on molecular uh, findings only would be no COVID-19. Luckily, the patients are also clinically assessed and it is always a combination between the clinical characteristics of your patients and your test results are the PCR and or serology in the potential future for 
patients. Okay, thank you very much. One very quick question. One person is asking, would you personally prefer... Sorry, you, your screen froze. Sorry, your question was missed by me. Would you personally prefer pooling in your own business setting? That is the other question. I think for my business setting, I will never use it, although I have had requests to reduce the cost from large airplane companies. We'll never use it if it is for um, diagnostic purposes and entering a plane, it is pure diagnostics and I think you should not pool. If someone offers me a large uh, club of samples, which are only used for epidemiological reasons, which are anonymized because you want to see what the prevalence is, Yes, you can pool, but for diagnostics, I personally am not in favor of pooling because you are missing weak positive samples. The only theoretical application in a clinic is if you look to symptomatic patients which have PCR values between 16 and 27. So if you then pool by 10 and you miss like four values, you will end up by 31, 32 then your patient is even in pooling still positive. But again, you will miss weak positives. And that is a, a debate from which I have not seen yet a clear answer if you should do that. Myself, I currently do not pool and I also will not pool. Okay, good to know. Uh, can I ask another question quickly? Um, um, one particular audience member is asking I, which- because yeah, you have to leave quickly one more question, please. Okay. Um, I'm pulling these questions in one question. Um, um, you, have, you have so much experience in these different types of testing. So their query is, which particular test gives the most amount of false positives or say false negative in your point of view for COVID-19? I think it's very difficult to give a, a yes or no for that because there are so many essays. So it depends highly on the essay itself. Okay. Okay. I think you All right. have to I, I leave. Yeah, I really have yeah. to go. With this, we come to end of our webinar. On behalf of IPC and JIBB, we, I would like to extend our thanks to the distinguished speaker for enriching our minds. We look forward for having more such discussions with you. Uh, we also thank uh, we also thank honorable vice chancellor sir mm -hmm. all the pro vice chancellors mm -hmm. registrar mm -hmm. sir for letting us conduct the same same a special thanks to wesley sir for arranging this webinar so smoothly i would also like to remind you all that on th 23rd of this month we will be having another webinar with the with the pan with number of panelists for discussion over covid 19 once again thanks to all the participants and listeners thank you very much